but it's the first mention anywhere of a person named Moses. So how could there be all these really systematic parallels? And uh, the other minimalists at Copenhagen, they believed that the Hebrew Bible was written very late you know, in the Hellenistic era. You started this research about the dates and similarities between Plato and the Jewish Bible. Barossus didn't read the Jewish Bible, but the authors of the Bible could have read Barossus. And it looked like the biblical authors were copying Manetho, who wrote about 285 BC. That event basically took place, but they didn't just translate these books into Greek. They wrote them there. So let's talk about your first book, which I think is one of the most important historical uh, documents. And the way it has been delivered is something amazing. Now, this is the question I really wanted to know. So what is the major reason that you started this research about the dates and similarities between Plato and the Jewish Bible or dates related to the creation of the Bible? So what made you look into this portion of history? Um, well, I'm, I'm first and foremost a writer. Um, I never aspired to be a university professor. Uh, colleges, I, I have nightmares where I'm locked in, in a seat listening to a lecture. Uh, but I love university libraries. I could spend days or weeks there. Um, so I was researching something else entirely. Uh, I was working on a book called In Search of the Pillars of Hercules. Um, the Pillars of Hercules were rumored to be at the Caucasus and at the Straits of Gibraltar and different locations. And I was wondering, where did they come up with the ideas of these pillars that Hercules inscribed with writings and plates at the end of, uh, of the earth? So I, I was, I, I wrote a book, um, and I was doing research on it, and I was at uh, the University of Oregon Library, and there was a reference to the Pillars of Hercules in a book called uh, The Babylonica of Barossus. So I located a copy that had all the surviving fragments from Barossus, every quote and every ancient author, all in one book. And I photocopied it because I, I did that. I would photocopy books and books and books and then take home and mark them up. And so I read the... Uh, Babylonica, the history of Babylonia by Barossus, who wrote around uh, 280 BC. And it had a creation story. It had 10 generations of very, very long lived kings before the flood. It had the flood story with ravens and an ark. And, you know, it just read like the first chapters of Genesis. And I was, I was floored. I was like, wow, because he did not read the Bible. He was in the Temple of Marduk in the uh, uh, city of Babylonia, and he, he read uh, Sumerian texts and Babylonian texts and cuneiform. He didn't read Hebrew. So how could there be all these really systematic parallels? So, um, you know, I categorize things into true and false and interesting. And to me, that was interesting. I, I, I didn't know what to make of it. So my friend, um, I'll mention his name, Greg Doudna, was going to the uh, University of Copenhagen, getting his PhD, studying under some luminaries, Thomas Thompson, uh, Niels Peter Lemke, and others. Um, so, so I wrote up my research, and uh, 
Well, well, first off, he drew to my attention the fact that Niels Peter Lemke and uh, the other minimalists at Copenhagen, they believed that the Hebrew Bible was written very late, you know, in the Hellenistic era. Uh, and to my mind, that made sense because it's possible that the book of Genesis was written after Barosis. I mean, Barosis didn't read the Jewish Bible, but the authors of the Bible could have read Barosis. That was possible. So I systematically uh, checked to see which direction the literary dependence went, because it went one way or the other, either Barosis was using the Bible, which he wasn't, or the Bible was using Barosis, which, as it turns out, he was. I did the same thing for Manetho's story about people expelled from Egypt into Judea, which he relied purely on Egyptian records and literary stories. He didn't have the Bible in front of him, that's clear. Uh, but the Bible has so many parallels with uh, the stories in Manetho. Uh, and once again, it looked like the biblical authors were copying Manetho, who wrote about 285 BC. So that meant that the uh, books of Moses were written, you know, after 285 because of Manetho, after 280 because of Barosis, and so on. I kept on researching. And it finally got to where the books of Moses had to be written uh, after about 272 or 273 BC. Now, the translation of the books of Moses into Greek um, took place around 273 to 269 BC. So, it was practically the same event. I mean, the dates were right on top of each other. And it finally clicked. All these Greek books that the biblical authors were using in the books of Moses, uh, they were all found in the Great Library of Alexandria. And there was a tradition that 70 Jewish scholars were invited to Alexandria by King uh, Ptolemy II Philadelphus to translate the books of Moses into Greek. Well, I concluded, yeah, that that event basically took place, but they didn't just translate these books into Greek. They wrote them there using sources they found in the Great Library of Alexandria. They wrote them in Hebrew and then translated it into Greek, like immediately. So it was two aspects of the same event. Um, so I just wrote up all my research as I went along, just because I'm a writer. And uh, I sent a copy of uh, all this research to my friend Greg Down in Copenhagen. And uh, he decided all on his own. I'm going to show this to Thomas Thompson, which he did. And then Thomas Thompson said, we have to publish this. So that's how my first book got published. You know, I didn't really have anything to do with it. I was just really involved in the love of research, love of writing, and then uh, get taken out of my hands. And, uh, you know, the rest is history in more ways than one. Uh, that's how it all happened. Uh, it was practically accidental. I'm just very curious about, um, you know, things in ancient history, and I love solving mysteries, and uh, it just happened. Uh, and you proposed a beautiful reason about why we should uh, believe that the Bible was written down in around 270 BCE. Now, would you like to tell us about the whole story from the invitation of Ptolemy and the translation of the Bible or what you proposed, the writing of the Jewish Bible? Certainly. Um, really, it all started a little bit earlier. Um, Alexander the Great conquered the East 
you know, very famously. Um, and after his death, the kingdom was broken up into, uh, you know, the Seleucids ruled from Babylon and the Ptolemies ruled from uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and, you know, other parts of the empire were ruled by other people, the Antigonids and others. So in Egypt, you had Ptolemy the I uh, Soter. Um, he was the first king of Egypt. Uh, he was one of Alexander's generals, and uh, he had this uh, vast empire to rule, um, which he didn't really know much about. So there was a gentleman named Hecateus of Abdera, uh, who was a Greek. He traveled to Egypt, and he wrote a, he wrote a book called the Egyptica, or the History of Egypt, where he talked about the Egyptians, their customs, their laws, their history, everything. Uh, and in it, he had a story. Well, he had lots of stories about how the Egyptians colonized the world. They colonized Athens, uh, the Black Sea, um, you know, you name it. They, they were there. Um, and they had, and Hecateus wrote one story that was just a typical Greek foundation story about the, how the Egyptians colonized Judea under the leadership of a man named Moses. And uh, because Egypt was overpopulated, uh, Moses was an Egyptian noble. He took an expedition, went over there. The land was uninhabited. He... Uh, create a, a constitution, he created their laws, he built Jerusalem, he built its temple, um, and uh, that's how the kingdom of Judea came about, according to Hecateus, you know, which was all fiction, um, just a very typical formulaic uh, foundation story about a colony established somewhere. Um, but it's the first mention anywhere of a person named Moses. That's the first mention in any literature of Moses, who went to Judea. He wrote their constitution. He wrote their laws, like any other colony leader in the Greek world. So, and he and Hecateus gave this uh, history of Egypt to. Uh, King Ptolemy Soter. Uh, so his, for his education and for the education of his sons who would succeed him on the throne, so they'd know about that uh, amazing civilization that they were now ruling. So fast forward a little bit to his son, uh, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who... Uh, started under his father, but he built this amazing library in Alexandria. He wanted to have every book in the world in that library to attract scholars everywhere, to be the world's foremost center of learning, which it was. Um, and one of the things that he wanted that his library was missing was He'd heard these rumors about how some guy named Moses founded a colony in Judea and wrote their constitution and laws, which Hecateus just made up, you know. Uh, but which Paul, Ptolemy II Philadelphus took seriously. So he wrote the uh, Jewish high priest and senate and said, hey, I want a copy of those laws of Moses for my library because we want all the laws of the world, basically. So they said, yeah, sure, why not? We'll do it. So they sent a delegation just like he uh, suggested. They went to the Great Library of Alexandria and the museum, uh, which was their name for the university there, uh, for King Ptolemy and his sons. Um, he put them up. They, free of charge, uh, feasted them. They were his honored guests. And uh, 
and they researched um, in the great library and came up with all these sources. They they came up with an Exodus source uh, story that kind of resembled the one by Hecateus of Abdera. They named the hero of that story Moses. You know, they changed a lot of it. But, uh, okay, if, if they want a lawgiver who's gonna, who wrote a Greek constitution, and uh, we'll give it to them because uh, it was a prestige thing. So they wrote the books of Moses. They investigated international law codes and came up with the laws of Moses and published it in Hebrew. Oh, they knew both Greek and Hebrew, so they were reading Greek sources, writing the, the Hebrew books of Moses, and then translating it back into Greek again for the Septuagint translation. Um, now, Plato also recommended that if you're going to come up with a national literature and divine laws in the ancient past given to your people by the gods, um, if you're going to come up with all of all of this for this new form of government you're inventing, then you want to research local institutions, local priesthoods, temples, anything you can get that's old and revered and tie it in to make to preserve this illusion that yeah, these were the laws that were given to our ancestors generations ago. So the Jews and Samaritans at Alexandria, they, they did have in their background a little bit of background in Mesopotamian law. The uh, Babylonians and Assyrians, uh, they conquered Samaria. There were Babylonians living there. These Babylonians, they, they knew the laws of Hammurabi and various others. They preserved those traditions down through time, and they helped... Uh, contribute to the writing of the books of Moses. And they sprinkled in uh, occasional laws of Hammurabi or whoever else they uh, knew, the law, some laws of Eshnuna, some Middle Assyrian laws, and they threw them in there too to give the illusion that, yeah, these were uh, the ancient laws of our ancestors. So you do have a little bit of uh, Mesopotamian legal lore in there as well. Uh, so anyway, they, they published it in, uh, in Greek and Hebrew. And uh, back in Judea, they uh, said these were, books were written by our ancestor in the past, Moses. And, uh, you know, they, they sold it. And, uh, and ever since then, we've, we believe that those laws go clear back to Moses. But they're rather more recent. Plato said, okay, if you're going to have a successful government, it's absolutely essential that the citizens believe their laws were ancient, given by the gods, and had not changed down through time. Uh, but that first generation, they're going to know better. So you also have to have this national literature that supports the story that supports the foundation myth. And nobody can read anything that's not in that national literature. And Plato said, if you can do that, if you can make those the exclusive educational documents in the new theocracy, then within a generation, all the kids growing up in that new system, they'll believe it all. And they'll believe their laws went back a thousand years. And that's exactly, that's exactly what happened. Uh, and, and it worked. Plato was a genius of sorts. Uh, he figured out how to do it, and it, and it, and it worked.